Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Elburn has said, um, we have uh, at FPA put a great deal of effort into uh, the Great Decisions uh, series. Uh, we try very hard to present uh, issues of, as objectively as we can. And what we try to do in the editorial board in the spring uh, of the year before it's published is to try to identify the issues which we think are going to be the critical issues uh, in the year or two ahead. Uh, and a number of you, I'm sure, are in discussion groups that use great decisions, uh, but um, Noel Latif and the entire board uh, is firmly behind the idea that we want to broaden the audience for great decisions. So we're delighted that Noel has been invited to uh, hand uh, great decisions to the debaters uh, at tonight's uh, debate in Florida. Anyway, I wanted to start uh, tonight um, talking about Asia with a story of the tiger uh, walking through the jungle. And uh, the tiger first came uh, to a mouse, and he said to the mouse, uh, Mr. Mouse, uh, can you tell me who is the strongest animal in the jungle? And uh, the mouse uh, said, oh, Mr. Tiger, there's no question. You are the strongest animal in the jungle. So the tiger was quite pleased with himself. And he went a little bit farther in the jungle, and he came to a gazelle. And it was a young female gazelle, and he was trying to decide whether to have her for breakfast or whether to ask her the same question. So he said, Miss Gazelle, could you tell me who is the strongest animal in the jungle? And she was quivering, and she said, oh, Mr. Tiger, there's no question about it. You're the strongest animal in the jungle. And in addition, you're very handsome. So he was very pleased with himself, <clears throat> and he went a little bit farther, and he came into a clearing in the jungle. And there was this old cow elephant there who had a torn ear, and she was blowing dust on herself and looked rather ratty. Um, and so he went up to her and he said, Mrs. Elephant, could you tell me who's the strongest animal in the jungle? And she just reached down with her trunk, picked him up, and threw him against a tree and almost broke his back. <clears throat> so he was a little discomfited, and he sort of brushed himself off, and he turned to her and said, don't get so excited just because you don't know the answer. <laughs> now, I think in many ways the United States is like that tiger. Uh, I think that there are very big changes ahead uh, that the United States isn't planning for. Uh, certainly, if one reads the defense planning guidance uh, for the U.S. government or uh, the major national security statements which have been put out in the last few years uh, by the current administration, um, they are really not cognizant of the fundamental changes which are ahead. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is give you a sense of how uh, the economic vibrancy in Asia uh, is likely to affect us, how it's affecting change inside Asia, but also how it's likely to affect the United States. Um, what I'd like to do is just mention the three broad themes. Uh, the book that Elbrun mentioned uh, of the rise of China and India uh, is upstairs if you're interested. Uh, to go into the details, it has lots of tables, and some of you may not find that congenial, but um, it provides a, the statistical backup for what I'm going to say. Also, in the handout that I've given you, uh, which you're welcome to take home if you'd like, obviously, um, you can get a preliminary idea of some of the issues that I'm going to raise. But I basically have three broad themes. Uh, the first is that the rise of China and India is very significant. Um, but its significance needs to be put in the context of the relative decline or stagnation of the Pacific Rim countries. If we'd had this discussion 15 years ago, um, the most popular uh, a book by an American author on Asia was uh, Ezra Vogel's book, Japan is Number One. The focus was all on Japan. The uh, bubble had burst in the Japanese real estate market. But Japan still had a GDP that was five times China's. Uh, and it was, without uh, exception, the leading economy in Asia. Uh, and it was certainly seen by many as a major threat to the United States. Uh, in the same way, um, the uh, dynamism of the smaller countries in Asia, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and then subsequently the ones in Southeast Asia, uh, led to a large number of books and articles on the Four Tigers, et cetera. Uh, all of us have been through that, but uh, the first and really fundamental point that I want to make is that the rise of China and India are significant in and of themselves, but they would have been much less noticeable uh, if Japan had recovered quickly from its crash 
uh, if South Korea, Taiwan, and the ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia didn't run into problems themselves. Um, my second major point is that um, China has changed its own strategy for dealing inside East Asia in a very significant way. It's changed it militarily, uh, it's changed it diplomatically, and it's changed it economically. Now, when we get into the tables and we get into the discussion, I'll give you more details. But in the late 1980s, uh, China was taking a relatively pugilistic approach to dealing with its neighbors. When it wanted to move into the Spratly Islands, it simply attacked the Vietnamese who were there, took over a place called Mischief Reef in 1988. Uh, when they were having trouble with the Taiwanese, they fired some missiles off the Taiwan coast <laughs> at the time of the election of 1996. Uh, and um, in general took a relatively harsh view towards its neighbors. Uh, that they have changed dramatically, and we can go into some of the reasons for it, but uh, they have also dramatically changed the way in which they're dealing with their neighbors economically. Um, if you looked at China in the early 90s, uh, the major view was this was a Marxist or socialist economy going through transformation. Uh, the question was how quickly could it reform? But it was basically an inward-looking society, and there were isolated pockets of modernization along the East Coast. But certainly the dynamism and the modernization that we're all familiar with in China today uh, had not been launched. And certainly at that stage, China was not an open society. However, by the early uh, turn of the century, uh, in 2000, 2001, China becomes much more confident uh, opens itself dramatically to trade and even offers a, com a free trade agreement to all the countries of Southeast Asia and actually moves ahead of Japan in terms of uh, openness uh, to countries in the region. And this has had an enormous effect within the region. And uh, again, we can get into this if you'd like. Now, my third major theme is that the U.S. Uh, is headed for trouble ahead. Uh, the reason I mentioned the story of the tiger is that a country that has um, the world's largest trade deficit is the world's largest debtor, uh, has run a budget deficit for 29 of the last 30 years, uh, and has a very serious set of problems in its financial markets, uh, is not the country uh, who can uh, necessarily tell others how to behave. Uh, so there's an enormous disconnect between um, the rhetoric and the assumptions of much of the foreign policy community and the economic underpinnings uh, of what's happening in the U.S. today. And that's going to have a fundamental effect on the region. Secondly, Japan is still having problems. Uh, the Japanese economy is still twice the size of the Chinese economy, but Japan's problems are significant enough uh, that uh, it's not likely to move quickly uh, into uh, leadership again in the region. Uh, and China, for a number of reasons, has uh, the diplomatic uh, edge in negotiating. Um, that leaves the smaller countries of the region, South Korea, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, looking for a protector, a guarantor, uh, and that leads us to our conclusion, which is that there are two aspiring nations in the region that where the political elites support major power status, where they want to play a larger role, uh, where they have dynamic economies, uh, and where they definitely want to um, move to center stage. And those two countries are China and India. So those are the major themes that we're going to uh, turn to. Uh, I'd like to just go quickly through some of the tables so you get a sense for the magnitudes. I'm not going to try to go into every detail, but it'll give you an idea of what's involved. Um, the first table looks at... Uh, uh, <laughs> Are, are there extra tables? Anyway, uh, the first table is for total uh, gross domestic product. Uh, again, during questions, I'd be glad to go into any details you'd like. But the important thing to note here is that in 1980, uh, China has a gross national product about like Indonesia's. So what we're talking about is just an enormous surge between 1980 and today, uh, an enormous transformation of the region. Um, the other countries are important, uh, though India is economy is large. Uh, India's economy is about the size of South Korea's. Um, I'll mention also, just 